Father Rutan, we would like to present to you our young men and women who have been prepared and are ready to receive the fullness of Christian initiation in the Sacrament of Confirmation. Each candidate has been well instructed and is accompanied by a sponsor. Father, I present to you the candidates from St. Joan of Arc. Please stand. I don't think you can begin to comprehend the gratitude I have for being able to celebrate this Sabbath. I've been a priest almost 10 years now, and this is one of the high points of my whole priesthood. And I did, I asked them to, to send us a bishop, as you can imagine. I asked several times, but I'm not gonna lie, when they said they couldn't have a bishop come here to do confirmation, I was overjoyed. So thank you for that opportunity. <clears throat> I know some of you are here today because this is a stepping stone. This is like a, a mini graduation. You know, some of you have already gone on to high school, but that's what it is. For some of you, it's, uh, it's going to be a party and a dinner afterwards. For some of you, you came here uh, under threat of punishment. Uh, not let alone the punishment of hell, but mostly your parents, you know, kind of driving you here. And lastly, there are some of you who came here and we've been waiting for this day forever. You really have. And you've anticipated all the wonderful things that come with this day. And so, whoever you are, for whatever reason you are here, I'm speaking to you today. And I would say not only to you, but to those of you who are out there who have been confirmed in the past and perhaps just haven't realized the graces of that yet. And so my message for you today is there will come a time when you believe that everything is finished. That will be the beginning. Now it's fair that the first thing we do is establish a reason for even being. How do we know that there is a God? Because if there isn't a God, we're kind of wasting our time today. It might be more like a graduation or a stepping stone. And I've done this uh, experience with some of you before and demonstrated how do we know that there is a God. Now please don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean we understand everything about the faith. It doesn't mean that we never doubt the faith. All that comes with being a human. But if we have a why, if we know that there is a God, then even at those points when we have our greatest doubts, even when we're in the pit of despair, or we think that Jesus is asleep, even in those moments, we will still go forward because we know why. You know, the early Christians in the church probably knew much less than you do now. But they died for their faith. You don't have to understand the faith to die for it. But there has to be a love. And so it begs the question, how do we know that there is a God? Because I could tell you there's a God because it's in the Bible. I could tell you there's a God because people believe in it, but that doesn't demonstrate it. We are in a world that is very atheistic, which is that we're not a God, actually seeks to destroy God so that we might live as we choose. So most people, if you ask them, if we don't have a God, how did the world come about? What will they say? This is the part where you can answer some questions. Okay? What would they say? Starts with a B, ends in a G, has a bang in the middle. <laughs> yes, the Big Bang, all right? And I agree with that. Now, my, my background is biology and chemistry, so I have a scientific background, and I do believe that. You know, one day God said, let there be light, and bang, there's an explosion, and everything comes out. But even in the Big Bang, which is a theory, by the way, not a law, but we treat it as a law, even in the Big Bang, the stuff had to come from somewhere. Even in the Big Bang, somebody had to light the match for the firecracker to go off. Something outside the system. And scientists, whether you're a Dawkins or a Gould, all these scientists who have written these papers and these vast books about how God is dead and there is no God, when you pose that question to them, who lit the fuse? They answer it with a capital S. They call it the singularity. But they do give it a capital S. So they acknowledge that they don't know. And they do acknowledge with the physics that we understand these days, 
They can't explain it. But there's no God. But we can't explain it. So most of us can acknowledge that there is something that was outside of that bang, if there was a bang, that lit the fuse, and that is what we call God. Now, this isn't necessarily the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it's God. At least we have this idea. Let them draw the little capital S. That's fine. That's God. All right? Now, we have to establish, is it a good God or an evil God? Now, the devil's advocates who are here among us, and there's always a few, would say, well, it could be an evil God. He just created us to be like little puppets that would kill each other and do his bidding and everything else. And that could be true. That might be true. So it's an evil God, like a little Loki that kind of puts things together so we can enjoy our misery. And they would say, there's too much misery in the world for God to be good. There's too much pain and suffering, so it must be an evil God. But that begs the question, if evil created, what would evil want the creatures to focus on? Itself. And therefore, it would kind of embed in the program a guarantor that they wouldn't focus on anything but evil. And that they would worship evil. And that they would definitely kill each other and destroy each other. And therefore, evil, if he were to create, could not create the creature with free will. Because then they might choose the good. They might choose the love. And they might choose not to focus on evil. And so we do have free will. I think we can agree on that. Some of us might argue. Sometimes I don't think I have. But we do. We have free will. And so the God that created us with free will must be a good God. Because he is not narcissistic. He is not the center of the universe. So we have to ask the question then, we have a God, and we have a God that is good, but is he a God that loves? How many of you love somebody? Oh, what a loveless bunch. <laughs> now, your family is sitting behind you, just so you know, so that comes back later. Yeah, we all love someone, whatever that love means. I mean, most people would define it in romantic ways. Our Holy Father uh, defined it as self-gift. So we all love, and we know that God created us. That God created everything, He created us. And the ancients would say, You cannot give what you do not have. I can't give you a car if I don't own one. I can't give you money because I don't have it. All right? You cannot give what you do not have. And so if you love like you've told me you love, then the one who created you must be able to love. The one that created you gave you the ability to love. And that's why he gave us the free will. Because you cannot force love on someone. Don't ever try it, it doesn't work. You know, you can say, uh, the king will say, you will love me, my people, or I will destroy you. And they'll say, oh yeah, we love you, you're great, you're the best king in the world. You know, that's not love, that's fear. You cannot force love. And so God, in giving us that free will and loving us, also takes a big risk that we might not love him that way. So we have established we have a God, and we have a good God, and we have a loving God. Well, doesn't it stand to reason that he would want a relationship with us? Doesn't it stand to reason? I mean, since he created you when he didn't have to, and he created you unlike any other ever. There is no one like you in the whole world. And I know some people are saying, thank God. <laughs> that, in a good way, in a good way. You know? There's nobody like you ever. And there never will be, and there never was. So God created you when he could have created anyone else, but he created you. And so he obviously wants a relationship with you. But he's God. And we're down here. And so how does he do that? Well, it starts at the beginning with Abraham and Sarah, and it goes through Moses and all the prophets and the law, up through John the baptizer. He gets to the point where he says they're never going to get it, so he becomes one of us. The second person of the Trinity empties himself and takes the form of a slave. Like One theologian once said, even if we didn't have the original sin in the Garden of Eden, God would have sent his son so that we could know him what he's about. And even when he sent his son, 
and his son left us to send his Holy Spirit. It's like he never leaves us alone anymore. He sends his Holy Spirit to us. And that's what we celebrate today. He sends the Holy Spirit, but he does not send the Spirit empty-handed. The Spirit comes with gifts. And there are seven gifts that the Spirit brings. Now, a gift is not something that you're due. It's not something that is owed to you. A gift is something that's freely given. And I don't know about you, but when I think about giving a gift, I'm trying to think, what don't they have yet? What's some original gift that I can give them that they will use or they might use in the future? And that's what the Lord is offering to us. He gives us these seven gifts. Do any of you have a clue what they are? Thank you for honesty. Yes. Give me one. Wisdom. Okay. So we have wisdom as one of the gifts. This is knowing what to do, when to do, how to do it. Wisdom oftentimes comes with age. But guess what? You don't have to wait. You're getting some of it right now. All right? So we have wisdom. What else do we have? Yes. Knowledge. Okay? The two kind of go hand in hand. If you're going to learn about anything, if you're going to study anything, you have to have a basic knowledge. And you have pieces of knowledge here and there. You take all this knowledge and you kind of put it together. And you might say, oh, now I have a complete what? Another gift. Another gift. Yes. Understanding. So I have this wisdom and I have this knowledge and I have this understanding. Everything is going great. And so now I can say, that's wrong and that's right and that's wrong and that's right and that's right. What is that? What is that gift when I can choose like that? What do you think? Yes. Right judgment. So we can make those good decisions. Now, if you have all that stuff, you have wisdom, you have knowledge, you have understanding, you have right judgment, but you're afraid to use these gifts, then you're never going to get anywhere. So you need this gift so that you are not afraid. Fear the Lord comes later. But yes, fear the Lord is another one. Yes. This confidence or this courage or this fortitude. The word courage comes from the Latin word for, which means heart. You have heart. And then, when you have all these gifts, and you go outside, and you look at our galaxy up there, the Milky Way galaxy, and you realize we're one of billions of galaxies, and we're in a solar system that's one of many, many solar systems, and in all that vast universe that God made, he decided to make us too. Well, then we experience the fear of the Lord, without a doubt. And when we realize this God that made all these wonderful things and in his goodness decided to make us too, that this God chooses to be in the form of bread and wine so that he can be closest to us. And the only proper response to that is reverence. High. These gifts that he gives to us in order to prepare us to be heroes. You know, when I was little, I wanted to be Superman. And my mom sewed me this cape, the Superman cape. So I made a deal with God one night and I said, if I wear this cape the whole night, if it's over me and it doesn't fall off, then in the morning, please make me Superman. And I woke up about halfway through the night, probably because I was cold. And there was the cape on the floor. And that's why I'm not Superman. <laughs> Just so you know. Things could have been different. So I decided to be a little more practical, and I thought maybe I should just be Batman. Because Batman is a human after all, and he can learn these skills over time. And so I started a list. I thought, started listing all the things that I'm going to need to be Batman one day. And I'm going to have to be good at this, and I'm going to have to learn this. And some of those things I actually did learn. And that was a motivation that got me to learn it. But the fact is, at the end, whether I mastered these skills or not, I was preparing to be a hero. And that's what you're doing. These gifts are not just empty promises. This is not some mythology that we speak of today. This is real. That the Lord is giving us the gifts that we need to be the heroes. And not just heroes of the faith. In your life, we can't divide up the two, faith and life. To be the heroes that he wants us to be in our life. So this is an opportunity for change. St. Paul will say, you know, put on the new self. It's a second chance. So as opposed to just looking at this like a stepping stone, or I'll get through this, and then we'll have dinner, or whatever else, this is an opportunity to start over again. So maybe in the past, you loved, or you didn't love. 
or you were generous, or you were selfish, or you helped people, or you didn't. And many of those times you did good things because you're afraid of going to hell. And you did bad things thinking, I can never be forgiven anyway, so I might as well keep going. This is the moment. It's a moment in your life where you stop doing what you do because you're afraid of going to hell. And you start doing what you do out of a love for God. That's what happened to these apostles and disciples of Jesus. You know, every time we see a picture of a saint, they look saintly. They weren't always that way. When Jesus picked them up on the way, they weren't saintly. And in fact, I think a lot of these guys and gals who followed Jesus, they followed him for a few reasons. Number one, he kept talking about this kingdom that he was going to have. And I don't know about you, but if you see someone who's garnering followers, and he's talking about a kingdom, I want to be at the right and left. I want to be right there. I want to be on the winning team. So they followed because they thought he was going to be the winning team. Secondly, they followed him because of his magic tricks. They saw how he could raise people from the dead and cure the blind and all this stuff, and they thought, I want to be able to do that one day. And then they saw him preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and everyone was, you know, just wrapped, watching him. Leaning on his every word, just grabbing it and taking it in, and thought, we want to be able to do that one day. And then he forgave people so easily. He offered them this gift of forgiveness. And they said, oh, we want to be able to do that. And so they followed him all around, and we know they had no clue. Because time and time, you know, James and John, Lord, should we call down fire? fire. No, we don't call down fire. Lord, you will never go and suffer. Get behind me, Satan. And again, and again, and again. And you still not understand. Because they had in their head these ideas of grandeur. And many of them left along the way because of that. But others found a point in their life that they wanted to change. You see, although they all followed him, I think, because of his notoriety, Jesus died. He failed. There was no kingdom. The magic was over. No more speeches, no more crowds, no more multiplication of food. It's all over. But they stayed. They didn't leave. They might have been drawn to him because of all those things. They didn't leave after it's all over. And so here they are. We read the story today. They're holed up in this upper room and they're scared to death. Now, you know, the Pentecost, it never says it was daytime or nighttime. I like to believe it was night. Because night is when all this stuff happens. You know, the nighttime is the time of darkness. They're out on the sea, and it was night. Judas left him, and it was night. They were in the garden, and it was night. Jesus prayed all night. You see this again and again. So here they are in this upper room, and they're scared to death. They didn't run. They're there, and they're scared. And there's no lights because they don't want to light any candles or anything out of fear if someone sees a glow, they're going to come in and soldiers will come in, they'll take them away. But as they're in there, all of a sudden there's a breeze. And the breeze turns into a wind, much like we had the other night where trees are kind of moving against the house. You can feel it. You can feel a gentle rumble of the room. And the room begins to shake a little and they're probably unnerved by this. And so they look to their leader, Simon. What should we do? What's happening? And now the wind gets louder. It's not just rumbling the door anymore. Now it's rumbling the walls, threatening to blow in the windows. They think it was like a sandstorm, or maybe like a storm on the Sea of Galilee, or maybe an earthquake that happened in the crucifixion. And they're all on edge. What do we do? What do we do? And what happens is, Peter goes over and he decides that he would be the leader as so often before. And he lights a little taper and he holds it in his hand. He goes closer and closer to the door. And the door is rumbling almost off its hinges. And as he gets closer and closer with the light, all of a sudden, the door blasts open. And this fire wind comes in changed All of a sudden, that doubt that they had now turned to courage. And the insecurity they had turned into this wisdom 
and this knowledge and this understanding. And they realize they would never be the same again. They could never go back to their old way of life. This was Pentecost. And this is confirmation. That's what confirmation is. You know, the, the psalmist today speaks so eloquently. And Cyril, I mean, they're, they're saying, the Lord does not, you know, just ignore our prayers. He hears the cry of the orphan. He hears the cry of the widow. The psalmist goes on to say, he, you know, about the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit and saved. Have you ever had your heart broken? I hope not. But you will. Have you ever had your spirit crushed? I hope not. But you will. And this is the God who will lift you up when that happens. That these gifts are not just things we memorize so that we can shout back. They're a reality. We hear about the Pharisee and the publican today. And I recall one point in my life when I was that Pharisee. I was very, very good at being that Pharisee. I decided in high school that I might be a priest. Go figure. This is how it works out, okay? And I decided since I'm going to be a priest, there are certain things I shouldn't do in college. And so I made a promise to myself, sex, drugs, alcohol, rock and roll was okay. But the other things, no. That I'd stay away from all that stuff preserve myself from the priesthood. Now, you have to be careful when you do that, that you don't fall into a sin that is much worse. And that is looking at all the people who might do those things and condemning them. Now, please don't misunderstand. We need to judge. We need to judge. That's right and that's wrong. That's why you get the gift of right judgment. But condemnation is something different. And what I found myself doing is, no one was good enough. Because even if they didn't do those things, they did other things that were not good for them. And so I isolated myself from them, made myself an island, essentially. And you make yourself an island, and you make yourself the judge and arbiter. It's a very lonely existence. And I think that's what I was suffering from. Aside from a little depression, I was suffering from that loneliness. I remember some evenings just praying that the Lord would take me. Because it was very painful. I never stopped praying. But I prayed. And one particular night, uh, a friend I had on campus, she called me. She had to go to the health center. And it was across campus. And back then, Shippensburg was dark. So you needed someone to walk with you. And so I begrudgingly agreed to do this. And we walked silently across campus. It was dark. And everything was quiet. And we walked into the health center. And she went in to see the doctor. And I sat down and I started paging through this book, Reader's Digest. And I came to this page that was entitled, Quotable Quotes. And at the bottom, there was a quote from a Louis L'Amour novel. And I saw it, and all of a sudden, time stopped for me. I didn't know what happened. It was so eerie. And I read it again. And I thought about my whole life and things that had happened to me and the way I was acting now. And thinking, do you want to live the next years of your life like this? And so I looked around and made sure no one was looking, and I tore that page out. And up to a few months ago, I had it hanging in my office until I gave it to someone who needed it more than I. The quote read, There will come a time when you believe that everything is finished. That will be the beginning. And it was. It was a moment of conversion. And I would tell you, that was my confirmation. Then, that moment was my confirmation. I had not used the gifts that I had received six years prior. Confirmation for me was a rite of passage. I just kind of went through it. And yet on that particular evening, when I finally opened up to the gift, the Lord gave me the second chance. And it's made all the difference. And from that, a firm resolve not to condemn anyone. Judgment, yes, you have to judge not to condemn. See, boys and girls, what do you want? What do you want? Think about it. 
Think about the next years of your life. What do you want? Because today our Lord is giving you a gift. He's giving you seven gifts. He's giving you grace. Grace to be heroes. Heroes within your own life and the lives of others. We must decide whether we're going to take that gift or not. But I'll tell you this. It's a gift that no one can ever take away from you. Ever. It's something that the world cannot touch. Any more that they can give you health or life or salvation. So today, this could be a rite of passage for some of you. Stepping stone. Party or dinner. Or it could be a moment. The moment you accept the gift. You may look at this as a time where you feel that everything is finished. This is the beginning. So I leave you with the words of blessed John Paul II. And I quote him directly. Be not afraid. Be not afraid.